Hare Krishna, dear devotees, please accept my humble obeisance as always to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to Guru Maharajas. Hare Krishna, dear Mataji, please accept my humble obeisance as always to Srila Prabhupada. Welcome back to our call. Um, devotees, uh, today we are going to continue with our three-part series uh, that is overcoming challenges in serving the spiritual master. Uh, today we are very fortunate to have uh, Her Grace Chiti Sakti Mataji from London. Uh, she is going to enlighten us on this topic and uh, this uh, today will be the second part of this series. Um, the title is Optimizing Vapu Seva. So um, Hare Krishna Mataji, please accept my humble obeisances of Ghosh to Srila Prabhupada and Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much for joining and giving your valuable time and association and uh, enlightening us on this topic. Um, I just want to give a brief introduction um, of yourself, Mataji, um, because if anybody has joined for the first time, um, they have to know. Uh, give me just two minutes, Mataji. Thank you. Um, Her Grace Shri Sakti uh, Devi Dasi Mataji uh, is a disciple of His Holiness Bhakti Tita Swami Maharaj, and uh, she has been practicing Krishna consciousness for over 25 years. Based in London, UK, she serves as a preacher, mentor, and Sangha leader. She is a trustee for Bhakti Vedanta Manor and for the Institute for Applied Spiritual Technology. She also serves as the chair for the Mental Disorders Subcommittee of Bhakti Vedanta Medical Association. Graduating from Imperial College as a medical doctor and specialized in as a consultant psychiatrist, she brings together over two decades of experience in scientific advances in mental health with Krishna consciousness and connects with a diverse audience of students, celebrities, politicians, healthcare professionals, and corporate leaders. She regularly broadcasts for BBC Radio on mental health, well-being, and spirituality with over 200 million listens. She features on TV and in a number of newspapers and magazines and has contributed to several books and papers. Thank you so much, Mataji, once again. Um, please take over the call. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, having me back. Um, so I'm here at your service. Uh, so let's uh, together uh, say the Mangal Archanam prayers and uh, invoke the blessings of the Acharyas. Om Gyan Timurandasya, Gyananjana Shalakaya, Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guruve Namaha, Shri Chaitanya Manobishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale, Swayam Rupa Gatam Ayam Dadati Swapadantikam, Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Atapad Kamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvetam Sarvadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakam Vitam Scha he Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jigatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Vrinda Vaneshwari Rishabhano Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priya Panchakalpa Turubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bevacha, Patitanam Bhavane Pyo, Vishnu Vipyo Namo Namaha, Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shiva Sadiga Ura Pakta Vrinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So thank you for having me back. Uh, I hope you all had a wonderful Radhashtami last week. So our, at our first session, we focused on um, looking at what Guru Tattva is uh, and uh, looking at Guru in terms of principle and the person. So today's session, we're going to spend a little more time uh, looking at strengthening Vapu Seva. What does that mean? This is strengthening personal service to the spiritual master. Sometimes that personal service is executed and delivered actually in direct proximity and sometimes via others, but it, we are actually directly serving the, the spiritual master's request in their presence. Okay, whilst they're present on the planet. Um, so actually I'm giving a slightly broader meaning. 
we're not just exclusively talking about you know helping the spiritual master with particular personal service or um when you're living in the same space or serving in the space, same space i would like to also open it out to actually serving the spiritual master when they are on the planet because there are many principles that um overlap and can help us uh execute our service our instructions in the right mood and actually having the right mood with vapu helps with vani as well i'm not running these sessions uh claiming to be an expert in service to the spiritual master in fact what i'm going to be sharing is my mistakes and hopefully because i've made mistakes uh, you will learn from my mistakes and uh, you won't make those mistakes so i won't go over what we did in the last session again um but just to remind ourselves and refresh uh, our memories and to bring ourselves back into the right space that really uh, the spiritual master is is sent to us and we really take shelter of the spiritual master when we are prepared willing wholeheartedly willing to accept undesirable and unplanned changes that may take place in our life um and also in our consciousness in the pursuit of reestablishing our connection with krishna which can often mean bruising at least at the very least if not destruction of our sense of identity here and um it's uncomfortable sometimes this requires big life changes sometimes there's no life changes but we feel more of a, a a subtle change a subtle change what do i mean by this we may feel some disturbance some agitation through the purification in our own consciousness in our mind step so but this this our the degree to which we are willing to accept these changes really determines to what degree the spiritual master can help us to make changes and this is really the basis of the strength of the guru disciple relationship because when we approach guru to inquire submissively when we approach guru to render service there's this openness that please uh help me to reform or reinstate my original consciousness and while some aspects of that are pleasing they're comfortable they are desirable right we we all want to spend time with our gurus once you find the person who instructions you find irresistible right whose classes when you hear them whose instructions make you feel compelled i i feel compelled to follow this personality's instructions when you meet that person there is naturally going to be some desire to serve personally and it's interesting because sometimes we think there is some philosophical special magic uh or very complicated science behind the way the guru disciple relationship works and invoking gurus and krishna's mercy but actually it's a lot simpler than that and i want to share a, there's a very nice book if you don't have it i don't know if it's still in print it's actually the spiritual master and disciple it is actually a collection of excerpts from all of shila prabhupad's books um and shastra which really go into this uh understanding of guru disciple relationship and i'm reading a, a little bit from part 4 um and part 4 focuses on the disciples qualifications we're not trying to in these sessions we're not trying to establish whether the guru is qualified uh you know what we're trying to look at is you know we're in a space where we're either aspiring for someone or we already have uh accepted shelter of someone and they've accepted giving us shelter they've accepted us as their disciple so the issue isn't so much looking at is my guru qualified this is am i qualified and to what degree am i qualified and how can i make myself more qualified and how can i you know really inquire submissively and render service properly um whilst keeping a balance so one of the things i wanted to share is by taking trouble for the satisfaction of the guru one becomes free from one's debt to him so last time when we met somebody asked the question how do we when we are engaging in personal service for the spiritual master keep our health our physical our mental health in balance 
uh, when we're constantly putting the spiritual master first. And I answered with actually, when we're with the spiritual master personally serving, that is not the time to be thinking about anything that came before that service or is going to come after that service. If we are, if we can, we should try our absolute best to be completely fully present, mind, body, and soul. That I'm available, every aspect of myself is available for you. And in some shape or form, those different aspects are going to be uh, molded. And to be molded, they have to be broken down a little bit which may also sometimes include our physical health. So but here, you know, in this excerpt from, this is actually from um, Krishna book. It talks about how taking trouble for the satisfaction of the guru, one becomes free from one's debt to him. So rendering service includes, you know, going that extra mile, allowing ourselves to be a bit uncomfortable. So let me just read this and then I'll continue. So this is from uh, Krishna book, uh, volume three. Krishna continued to talk with his Brahmin friend. My dear friend, I think you remember our activities during the days when we were living as students. You may remember that once we went to collect fuel from the forest on the order of the guru's wife. While we were collecting the dried wood, we were by chance, sorry, we by chance entered the dense forest and became lost. There was an unexpected dust storm and then clouds and lightning in the sky and the explosive sound of thunder. Then sunset came and we were lost in the dark jungle. After this, there was severe rainfall. The whole ground was over flooded with water and we could not trace out the way to return to our Guru's ashram. You may remember that heavy rainfall. It was not actually rainfall, but a sort of devastation. On account of the dust storm and the heavy rain, we began to feel greatly pained. And in whichever direction we turned, we were bewildered. In that distressed condition, we took each other's hand and tried to find our way out. We passed the whole night in that way. And early in the morning, when our absence became known to our Gurudev, he sent his other disciples to search us out. He also came with them. And when they reached us in the jungle, they found us to be very distressed. With great compassion, our Guru Dev said, my dear boys, it is very wonderful that you have suffered so much trouble for me. Everyone likes to take care of his body at the first, as the first consideration. But you are so good and faithful to your Guru that without caring for your bodily comforts, you have taken so much trouble for me. I am also glad to see that bona fide students like you will undergo any kind of trouble for the satisfaction of the spiritual master. That is the way for a bona fide disciple to become free from his debt to the spiritual master. It is the duty of the disciple to dedicate his life to the service of the spiritual master. This simple act of pleasing the spiritual master, Prabhupada explains is, is actually what attracts the spiritual master's mercy. What do we mean by mercy? What does that mean? Mercy is good wishes, isn't it? We ask for blessings, we ask for mercy. Mercy and good wishes and blessings, they're the same thing. Good wishes is a very easy way to understand blessings. And when we please someone, their good wishes become activated, right? They, they flow incessantly. And what is it that somebody wishes for another person? Generally, when we're really, really pleased, whatever it is we have, the best of, we offer it. Don't we? When someone makes you really happy, you don't even feel shy to offer them the best of what you have. And what is the best thing that the spiritual master has? What is the best thing that the guru has? Why have we approached guru in the first place? Love for Krishna. Absolutely. So this is the thing. When we please the spiritual master, they're not wishing for us to have a better car or a better job or more children, <laughs> you know, or whatever it is we want, higher grades, um, more money. That's not what they send their good wishes. Their, their good wishes are, oh, this person has pleased me so much. I really, really want them to reconnect with Krishna. I really want them to. Krishna, please, please 
show yourself to them. Please let them feel your presence in their heart. I mean, this is how the spiritual master uh, petitions on our behalf. There's a really nice prayer in Beggar 2 where Bhaktisiddhartha Maharaj elaborates on this, that, you know, he's reached the gates of the spiritual world and he's told by the uh, personalities there that actually it's nothing really that you did that got you here. It's actually the, the cries and the begging of your spiritual master because your spiritual master knows the humble art of begging. And what makes them beg on our behalf is when we please them. And the simplest thing can be pleasing to the spiritual master. Perhaps it's a glass of water. Perhaps it's something more complicated. But in personal service, if there's some discomfort on our part and some discomfort is required and generally it's required, then that discomfort the spiritual master is aware of. This is an expression of love. Love is not just a feeling right? Any of you who've ever served the spiritual master closely, personally, it's exciting, right? You feel exhilarated at the prospect of doing it. Like, oh, I've got service for Guru there. Almost to the point where you're ready to push everybody else out of the way to go to your service. And it's, it's, it's wonderful because we feel like, yes, here's this pure via medium. Uh, none of my Maya affects me when I serve my spiritual master. I'm so enthusiastic. It seems like all obstacles move out of the way. I can do anything for my spiritual master. And it's exciting. But it feels like that in the beginning. Yes, because it's new. It's novel. And we delude ourselves that the problems we have in our relationships with others are often because of their issues. And it's not us because we don't have those issues with the spiritual master. But I remember one time Maharaj sitting us down um, as we stayed, uh, as one month became two months and Guru Maharaj's departure, you know, was, was becoming more apparent. Sat us down and he said, you know, it's exciting to serve the spiritual master for a few weeks or even a couple of months. Um, it's new, it's exhilarating. Um, you feel happy. You get a break from other people's stuff. You get a break from your own stuff. You feel like you have this transcendental energy fueling you. Your ego and mind don't give you so much trouble because you can really see that spiritual master is special. But after a couple of months, your mind and your ego kick in. And all the things that block us from serving others with the same enthusiasm, right? Because we don't see guru in others, not so easily. The things that block us from serving others with the same enthusiasm start to manifest. And we, that was part of our purification. And he was showing that actually, normally that purification comes from the spiritual master because we start to feel our ego and mind become uncomfortable around the spiritual master. Doing the simplest thing starts to become difficult because we then start to think about what about me? What about my feelings? So however, it's going to be more difficult for you guys because first of all, I'm leaving. So the purification is even more intense and secondly because i'm leaving a lot of your purification will come from each other you will draw the very you know darkest uh, and ugly side of each other out out you know this is what he was explaining so uh, where am i going with this where i'm going is this mood that actually by making ourselves a little bit uncomfortable in order to serve the spiritual master in this example krishna's out with Sadama to get firewood, right? Uh, firewood from the forest on the instruction of their guru's uh, wife, who they treat like a uh, mother guru, right? And so it's as good as guru's instruction. And they, they came across so much difficult. They're just young boys. They're not grown adults, just young boys. But they tolerated those difficulties with faith, with faith and with love. Okay, so first thing is tolerance. When we are with the spiritual master and the body becomes tired, the mind becomes agitated, we start to see that the spiritual master has needs, human, physical needs. We can sometimes think, huh, is this person ordinary? Spiritual master becomes irritable, perhaps when they're sleep deprived or when they're hungry. Hmm. I thought my spiritual master was supposed to have control 
over the urges of the tongue, belly, and genitals, right? I thought my spiritual master was supposed to have control over the urges of the tongue and anger. What's going on here? My spiritual master needs me. But Srila Prabhupada is very emphatic. He says, actually, the fact that the spiritual master appears to need our service is to our advantage because it actually gives us an opportunity to very easily render service, very easily um, do something that is pleasing for the spiritual master. And in close proximity, very easily become aware of our anarthas, where our ego's biggest attachments lie, where our ego's biggest aversions lie. And in this way, if we surrender to that, if despite that discomfort, we continue to serve with an open heart and an open mind, those things are removed. I don't know if you've ever used, you know, you get those mud masks, those clay, those clay masks. You put that on your skin, anybody who's ever tried it. And as it dries and hardens, it literally draws out, draws out in a very deep way, everything, all the rubbish from your skin. Okay, anybody who's ever tried a clay mask, um, you'll, you'll know the experience. It starts off gentle, it feels nice and cooling and soothing. But as the clay hardens and it really starts to work, it starts to feel uncomfortable. You feel restricted and your skin starts to itch and you kind of think, I want to get this stuff off as soon as possible. <laughs> right? And then you're relieved when you rinse, rinse your face. But look how much dirt has come out with it. So sometimes being with a spiritual master can feel like this. In the beginning, it feels nice and cooling and soothing and wonderful. Like, yeah, I can't wait. My spiritual master is going to purify me with this service and I'm going to fly in my Krishna consciousness and I'm going to do even more service. And this is going to be so wonderful. And then the mind and ego, they start to go, hmm, look at him. Look at your guru. Look what they're doing. Look how they're sitting. Look, I mean, one devotee was very honest with me recently. He was saying that he was serving his spiritual master and he caught his mind saying, oh, look how he walks. I don't like the way he walks. Go, look how he talks. Why does he talk like that? You know? And I was like, yeah, the mind is, the mind is crazy. The mind will find any old thing to criticize. And we know from Shastra, actually, the spiritual master, you are not, and, and any saint, any sadhu, we're not supposed to judge a devotee based on their physicality. Because being a devotee has nothing to do with our physicality. We know this from Lord Chaitanya's pastimes. He has his intimate associates took birth in every varna, in every ashram, and in all sorts of cultures and religions. Okay, they, you know, all sorts of cultures and religions and all levels of uh, society. So uh, they were very honest that they were aware that their mind was doing this. The thing is, when your impurities are being drawn out, it is up to us, do we act on those impurities and become offensive to the spiritual master, either by just not executing the service, executing it begrudgingly, um, leaving, okay? Or actually really with outwardly offensive behavior, with criticizing or chastising the spiritual master like it's our place to tell them how to be a devotee. Or do we tolerate the pain of having and the discomfort of having the impurities drawn out and still maintaining proper etiquette, maintaining a proper service attitude and trying to be as submissive and loving in our service. And that really, you know, that love develops, the, the love between the guru and the disciple, it develops and it develops to the degree that we are prepared to take discomfort. We have to tolerate discomfort. If we're trying to get out of that discomfort by saying, okay, I'm going to react to how my mind is reacting. I'm going to do something about it. We're not tolerating the discomfort. We're looking for a solution. I remember one time, uh, you know, I was sharing with you, I went through this period of heavy chastisement from Marge. And sometimes I would be crying for hours, you know, hours in a day. It got to a point where Guru there was literally like, and whenever he called me for service, he was like, bring your box of tissues. <laughs> I'd be lapped up under one hand and a box of tissues under the other hand. <laughs> and, and one of my God sisters really helped me. On this particular day, I was really crying. And I was crying and she said, oh, are you okay? What's going on? And so I started sharing some of the things I was crying about, you know, because my 
I was really being crushed, you know, I was feeling like a nobody. And at the same time, I was also very pleased, but my mind and ego were just ah, exhausted. And you know, she just said something very simple to me. She said, said, you're just thinking about your pain. Look at his pain. Look at what he's going through. And despite what he's going through, he's taking the time to help you. And it was so help just that simple thing. It just was like a light bulb moment. I just dried my tears and I just went back to my service, but not like mechanically, really filled my heart with love. And this is where our, our relationships with each other in terms of God family, God cousins, really, really important. Because I could also feel that that instruction was coming from my spiritual master. It was coming from him. He was saying, I'm doing this because I love you, because I care about you. I'm causing you pain because at the moment, things are all crooked. I'm trying to straighten it out. You know, if you have a dislocated shoulder, don't you welcome the pain that the doctor puts you through when they put your shoulder back in place or your joint back in place when it's dislocated, right? You welcome that pain because you can see, okay, well, I'll be able to do so much more once my shoulder's back in place. So in, our, in serving the Vapu, if there's some discomfort, if there's some challenge, if there's some difficulty, which inevitably there will be, especially where there's purification happening. Now, it may not be physical, it may be psychological, you know, either from the ego or in terms of disturbance in the mind. But that disturbance is a sign of progress. It's a sign that the guru disciple relationship works. You want to clean anything, you've got to agitate it. We were talking about this the other day. Anyone, you know, you might not all have used face masks, but I'm pretty sure you've all washed clothes and you've all washed a stain off your clothing. Letting it soak usually is not enough. If it's a deep rooted stain, it needs a scrub. And the deeper the stain, the more the scrubbing required, the more agitation that's required. So when we, if we want to strengthen the relationship with uh, the spiritual master through Vapu Seva, we've got to be prepared for agitation and discomfort. And if we're prepared for agitation and discomfort, then the spiritual master knows that we're ready. We're giving them permission to say, okay, train me. You know, I remember one time, uh, again, during this period, some so before Maharaj went into Nirajan there were a few devotees who were coming from some disciples from other parts of the country around the world who wanted to have their final respects, final goodbyes with Gurudev. Um, and then they were booking time in. And Gurudev was very um, limited in terms of, he, he was very specific about who would, he would see and who he wouldn't see. And I remember one particular family traveled from all across the country to see him. And they would have had to have made great plans, gone through great endeavors to come to see him. Anyway, they came in, they saw Guru there. They spent maybe 20 minutes, half an hour with him. And every time I was going in to maybe change water or do some service in the room, they were smiling, laughing, joking. And they looked very happy. And they left. And as they left and I went in the room, Gurudev said, Chiti Shakti, you know, most disciples want to enjoy the spiritual master. They want the spiritual master to make them feel wonderful, to make them feel happy, to make them feel like a good disciple, and to make them feel loved. So most disciples want to actually enjoy the spiritual master rather than serve. And he got very heavy, and he said, don't become that kind of disciple. Because in one sense, when we're looking for comfort in serving the spiritual master, we are also trying to enjoy, we're looking for a solution. You know, there's a subtle side to it. We may not be looking for a pat on the back. We may not be looking for glorification. We may not be looking for um, statements about how wonderful we are. But we may be looking to alleviate our discomfort. But Prabhupada here very clearly is explaining that it's that very willingness to be uncomfortable for the spiritual master that allows us to become free from the debt 
to the spiritual master. And what debt is this? This is the debt that has uh, an invaluable value in the sense that you can't put a number on it. You know, to, to allow or to facilitate a person to uh, reconnect with Krishna, not just reconnect, to fully wake up. Is there a price on that? There's no price because these personalities have given their life and soul and even their own spiritual lives in one sense. You know, the spiritual master cries out, take my credits, give them to my disciples, give them to all the souls in the world. I'll suffer, it's fine. You know, let them just be with you. And so is there, can we ever repay that debt? Not really. But by taking some discomfort for the spiritual master, tolerating it, and then moving beyond it, we please them. We please them by endeavor. And it is our privilege when they need us, even if it seems like they are coming across as mere mortals. Now, different devotees are going to have different inclinations to serve the, the physical aspect of the spiritual master. But if you get an opportunity to serve, do so. Because it is like that deep cleansing clay mask. You know, you get all the soft, gentle ones, and it's fine, it's comfortable, and, and you know, your skin might look great on the surface afterwards, but it's, the purification is happening at a surface level. Um, if you can, if you are able to set aside some period in your life, whether it's a few days, a few hours, a few weeks, or a few months, I highly, highly, highly recommend going through the process of direct service to the spiritual master. Okay. And there is actually, if we have a sincere desire, there is actually no real obstacle uh, in terms of being allowed to do this kind of service and engaging with the spiritual master on this intimate level. If we want to be purified directly in the fire, we can be. You know, there is, there is no body we're in, there is no material situation we're in, um, and there is no um, geographical boundary, and there's no other person who can block it either, if there's a sincere desire. Honestly, we have that faith, that mercy tra transcends everything. But, you know, we, we briefly last time went over these four different types of disciples, the first class, second class, third class, and fourth class. The third and fourth class, really, we should be avoiding, okay? And we should be, and the best way to avoid it or transform it is to be honest with ourselves when we are in that space. Whether it's with Vapu or Vani Seva, am I a third class disciple where I have to be asked to do things, but I do it begrudgingly? Are we catching ourselves doing that? Or I'm getting instructions, but I'm neglecting them. So third and fourth class, really, you want to get out of those zones as quickly as possible. And the best way to get out is to be honest with yourself that you're in that space rather than deluding yourself that you're somewhere else. Ideally, we want to be first class, but we at least have to go through second class to get to first class. So second class is being instructed and enthusiastically executing those instructions. So when we enthusiastically execute those instructions, when we're enthusiastic, we're receptive, right? Think about everybody in there, maybe you were a teacher's pet at school, <laughs> or maybe you knew a teacher's pet. The person who's so enthusiastic to learn, the teacher feels like giving them more and more and more. So a lot of training can happen at this time also, to the point where you then become like the first class disciple, the disciple who doesn't need to be told what to do because they know the spiritual master's heart so well, they do it without being asked. Okay, so this, this Vapu Seva is a really nice place to establish, nice time to establish this kind of relationship. So this is meant to be, you know, I'm at your service to help and serve you with the mistakes that I made. Um, and if I can serve you in any way to strengthen that Vapu connection, I think it's best done if, if I can hand over to all of you now and really just ask you to churn have a think uh, and really share what some of your challenges are, particularly in personal service to the spiritual master. Because next time we'll focus on serving in separation, but this time let's focus on serving personally. So what are some of the challenges you experience when you're doing personal service? And by this, I also mean if your guru has given you a specific instruction and you may not be in physical proximity, but you're finding, guru, they've asked me to transcribe this or guru, they've asked me to do this. Oh, it's one year later and I haven't done it. You know, 
Uh, this is also a, a very personal instruction in terms of Vapu. It's been received in the presence of the spiritual master. Thank you, Mataji. Um, I request devotees to participate in the discussion. Oh, thank you so much. It's Satibam Mataji, you want to go ahead? Yeah, Hare Krishna Chiti Shakti Mataji. Hare as always, last session and this session, it was a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. And uh, I've been serving actually Guru Maharaj from last few years, whenever he's in London, I prepare, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, Prashad for him. And uh, it's really nice service. But this year, uh, as you said that, uh, you know, it made you cry. And this year, it made me cry as well. It was so funny. I think I just felt that, you know, Maharaj was testing me. <clears throat> mm. If I have that feeling of, you know, enviness, uh, enviness in me, within me, because I've noticed quite a few times in front of me, when um, quite a few of us um, uh, went there to uh, with Bhoga Prashad and uh, he always he was telling me no you Prashad there's something is wrong with this something is wrong with that and I was telling that's fine Maharaj Guru Maharaj please don't accept it it's fine it's okay it may you know uh, it might not be nice because I'm not a good cook anyway so I just felt like after that I felt oh I wish he could just have you know a, a morsel of it or just little bite of it and uh, it would have made me happy. And then I thought, no, but if it, it wasn't nice, then he shouldn't have tested it because it's not a nice thing, but basically he should have the best. And uh, that I felt like, you know, it just made me cry that I wish I could, you know, improve on my cooking and make something nicer for him next time when he comes. So it, it happened quite a few times this time. And uh, it just, uh, you know, I think it's a sadness that uh, you can't perform to your best when you want to like you just use your inability to serve a guru and with krishna basically you can put anything in front of krishna and he just you don't know if he has accepted not accepted <laughs> but with guru <laughs> he will tell you off oh, if he's not nice or something and then you should have that you know uh, uh, courage maybe to you know accept it that yes uh, what you have done is not right it's not correct and you could have improved yourself basically but, you know, it's interesting what you're sharing is the different layers you went through, right? First, you realize that, my gosh, uh, I'm upset because I really wanted him to like what I made, right? Because it's... Yeah, like as in accepted, basically, not like, but, you know, I, I accept the service, basically, I should say, rather than liking the food. I would, I wouldn't put it as like the food. The, no, 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 my food is not good at all, but it's just the service. <laughs> Yeah, but the, it, it's it's similar in the sense that, you know, would you want your uh, spiritual master to accept something that they don't like? No. So you do, in one sense, want him to like what you're making, right? Maybe, Even yeah, if yeah, you can say that, yes. This is, yes, we want, we want the spiritual master to perhaps acknowledge that they are pleased by what we've done, right? But if they're always pleased by what we've done, then where is the room to grow? Yes, absolutely, you, yeah. So, and then you're saying that, okay, but then from that pain, it developed for you that you said, actually, this is making me want to open my heart and learn how to cook in a way that is pleasing to him, that will make him want to accept it. You know, so this, uh, this, this feeling of wanting to do what's most pleasing is really very much in our real nature. Rather Rani has it, is, is the embodiment of that feeling. She wants to do what's in Krishna's best interest so much, she is willing to move out of the way and let somebody else do it if they're better equipped at doing it. Which is why and how so many millions and billions of gopis and gopas have service for Krishna. And because everybody's got their own unique valuable service that we can offer and yes. Radharani mesmerized and is the source the facilitator um, and you know celebrator of our uniqueness because she will move out of the way in order to facilitate Krishna's pleasure so this is something we can also do is this is next step you know first so first of all recognizing that hang on a minute is it this is about pleasing Gurudev or actually my happiness that I have made something nice. Then there's a second stage that, okay, this is encouraging me to do better service. But also we can try to seek out those members of the God family who perhaps are very expert or maybe better than us at doing something and encouraging them to offer that service. Because by serving another person to come closer to the spiritual master, we attract even more mercy. Mm. 
very true yes, actually up in cooking for the spiritual master we try to feel like i should be able to do anything everything right i remember in one class actually uh kripa mwepra was talking about uh serving krishna and how we often pray oh krishna if i had more money i'd get you this if i had more time i'd do this for you if i had more facility i've had more programs so we often look at what we don't have rather than what we do have but when we fully use what we already have mm. then krishna sends us more but even better than that we fully use what we have and then we can be resourceful because well who has what i don't have and can i engage them in the spiritual master service will That's that true, will that, because that will really please the spiritual master that because i remember guru Maharaj once saying in a class he said it's not just that the spiritual master wants one excellent disciple. In fact, if the excellent disciple can encourage all other disciples to be excellent, that makes the spiritual master most happy. It's kind of like Krishna and how Radharani empowers all of us and facilitates all of us to be at least a little bit like her, you know? <coughs> Forgive me. I was going to say, you know, also sometimes... And I know this isn't directly related to your question, but sometimes the spiritual master takes on different personas or different aspects of their persona manifest or hidden, depending on what we need. Sometimes they joke, sometimes they're grave, sometimes they're very instructive, and sometimes they seem quite relaxed, but actually it's up to us. But one thing that I really saw in my experiences with Bhakti the Marge is that everything that the spiritual master says and does is either an instruction or a test. Mm -hmm. Everything. Even if it seems very ordinary, very mundane, or even a joke, there's an instruction there or a test. And if we I have could definitely feel, yeah, feel it as a test because I, could, I, I was seeing a face that he was looking at me and seeing that how I how would I react it and I was just smiling at the time. But literally, I thought this is so funny. Right, exactly. That they see past the smile. <laughs> you <know>? Yeah. <laughs> they see past the smile. Uh, let, let the process take place. Let yourself feel uncomfortable rather than trying to run away from the discomfort and do what will make you feel less uncomfortable. You know, and if you pray like that, that okay, Guru Dev, you know, I see this is a test. Uh, please, by your mercy, let me understand what, what you're testing and help me to pass the test. They'll reveal, like Krishna explains, the spiritual master is from without and from within. Mm. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you so much. Very useful. <laughs> Thank you very much. This is what we'll, we'll get the most out of this session if devotees can, you know, share their experiences. Someone has shared something in the chat room. Um, I find that when serving Guru, sometimes you can get big headed, whereas you should be thankful for the opportunity to render this service. We sometimes think that by doing service, we can grow closer to the spiritual master, but are we actually following their footsteps? So, yeah, why do we get big headed? Because we usually get big headed when we see the spiritual master as an extension of our false ego. Because you're great, because my Guru is great, that means I'm great. If you're honest with yourself, you know, that is actually the dialogue that's there going on subtly in the false ego. This person's so wonderful and I'm right next to this person. So I'm also so wonderful. Your ego is like, yeah, look at you. You're so wonderful. Your Guru Maharaj would not keep you around unless, you know, you were very special or you had special favor. So actually, as um, so I think I may have shared this last time, the kind of three ways that the, the spiritual master chastises the disciple. And one of them is through direct you know, verbally directly chastising the uh, disciple. But he also shared that actually, you know, when, when the guru directly chastises the disciple, there's got to be a few elements that need to be in place. One is that the disciple has to be ready to receive that chastisement. And second, there's got to be enough time with the spiritual master for there to be clarification um, and understanding of what the chastisement is about. And thirdly, there's got to be other people there to support, usually God family, because it can be difficult. But um, this, this, uh, this chastisement that we undergo 
uh, and having in, in the process of being a personal servant, Maharaj then goes on to explain that there are two types of disciple the spiritual master keeps close by. So because there's this whole idea of being purified by consciousness and also chastisement, when you're in close proximity with the spiritual master, he said, either the spiritual master keeps disciples around whose consciousness is so clean, it's very easy for the guru and disciple to spend a lot of time together without there being too much disturbance and agitation. Or their and their relationship is loving and strong where there is, there might be agitation and disturbance, but they can talk it through and it's fine. Or, and he said, more often than not, the disciple, the spiritual master keeps very foolish disciples in close proximity. He was pretty heavy about this. He said, what do I mean by foolish? There are some disciples who are so ignorant of their stuff. They're so ignorant of their stuff. They think they're so special that the only way to teach that disciple is actually by all the foolish mistakes they make in the personal service of the spiritual master. So when we think we're special because we think the guru's uh, an extension of our false ego, you know, we should remind ourselves actually the reason my spiritual master keeps me close is because I need this kind of purification and this kind of uh, chastisement. Um, if, in fact, if I was any good, they'd trust me to just get on with it away from them. <laughs> you know? So sometimes, sometimes this kind of um, mindset and reflection can be helpful. And actually, one thing uh, Guru they've also shared was it's the opposite, really, that when the spiritual master has close servants around, the guru sees the close servants as an extension of their own physical body. So they will be even more heavy because they will treat the disciples the same way they would treat their own body, expecting themselves that I will be as uncomfortable as necessary in order to execute my spiritual master's mission. Um, Srimati, there's another question in the chat room. Are you happy for me to take it or is there something else from... Yeah, um, uh, it is actually... I don't see any question on the chat. Um, it's like a, a comment, I think, from Renu Mataji. Um, um, thank uh, you. Uh, you I've already and it really has gone in. There is no doubt that when you really desire to serve in a particular way, then that comes true. I'm always surprised by this mystical process. I know where I am and what to do to go to the next step with your clear analysis and expression. I'm not really daunted by the long road ahead of me. Big thank you. Okay, that's reassuring. <laughs> uh, Sharadia, you have your hand up. Thank you for the wonderful class. So, I have a, I have a question. I think it might sound a bit controversial. Sharadia, your line is out. Oh no, is it better now? Yes, you're back. Okay. All right, so I had an experience, it was many years ago, so I was quite young in age and also young as a devotee, and I was in the, when there's the big Rathiatra of a I wasn't actually, I'm sorry, Sharadia, you we're, we're losing you pretty much every other word. Yeah. I think uh, she's outside somewhere. Okay, Sharadia, while you work on your connection, can I, I'll take maybe yeah. something from someone else? Yeah, I have a question, Mataji, like um, mm -hmm. you were talking about second class and first class devotees, uh, and disciples. So, um, so how do we transition from second to first, like uh, when we are neophytes in uh, Krishna consciousness and mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> we are new to spiritual master and we doesn't know much about spiritual master. At that time, we'll be mainly focusing on the instructions given to us and uh, to work on this or that, like that. And um, you know, so, so how do we transition ourselves uh, or uh, from second class to first class? Practice, like with any knowledge, although with the guru disciple relationship, it transcends just ordinary knowledge. But with even regular knowledge, the more you do something repeatedly, the more you it becomes second nature. Yes. Right. Yeah. To a point where someone asks you, how do you do that? You kind of have to go, well, I'm not sure how I do that. Right. <laughs> I don't know, for example, I'm making an assumption here. I'm assuming you're very good at rolling chapatis. Right. Uh, and you're so good. You don't really know how you do it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> you know, for such a long time, they're always round. They always puff up. And it's uh, someone asks you, how do you do that? You go here. Just watch me. 
you know, because it's got to a point where you almost can't break down the stages because you've done it so many times. So actually what happens is whether it's Vapu or Vani Seva, when we repeatedly follow the spiritual master's instructions. And you know, last week we were reflecting very much on even those main instructions that the guru gives everybody. Rather mm. than getting caught up in, I want a unique instruction. That instruction that they give everybody, chant the holy names, follow the principles uh, of liberation, cooperate with each other, facilitate each other to advance in your spiritual life we follow those just doing that repeatedly day in day out moment by moment gets us to a point where we are so strongly connected with guru tattva and guru parampara and their blessings that actually we don't then need to constantly be told what will my guru Maharaj want me to do how would my guru want me to behave because everything we're here in the hearing in the classes we're trying to already execute and then it becomes second nature so actually it requires practice to go from second to first class and vapu seva helps because you get a practice ground in a very concentrated time period it's like boot camp yeah. but Prabhupada is very clear that's not necessary he says it's important and we should try and get it if we can and if we have a desire to but he says it's not necessary. And if we look at Srila Prabhupada and many of his disciples, many of them didn't see Srila Prabhupada uh, very regularly. You know, there's some disciples who say Prabhupada only ever said one thing to them. Mm. Some disciples say they only ever saw him once. Other disciples were with him all the time and they left. Why? Because that Vapu Seva is also, although it's very sharp in terms of cutting through an earth is like a knife. But what happens with a sharp blade is if you misuse it, you can cut yourself, right? So when devotees make offenses in Vapu Seva, then it leads to their relationship with their spiritual master being temporarily cut as well. So um, repeated following of the spiritual master's instructions, both Vapu and Vani, moves us from second class to first class disciple. Because we want to go beyond just connecting with the spiritual master in their human form, in their physicality. We want to connect with actually what, Guru's transmitting to us via Guru Tattva. You know, as we were sharing last week, last time, Guru is the place where we meet Krishna. Yes. So when we follow Guru's instructions, we meet Krishna. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, definitely. So yeah. Second class, practice, 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 and we okay. get to first. First class, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I think there's a question from Sumyendu and Monidipa. Yeah, they raised their hand. Yes. Oh, Hare Krishna Mataji. Thank you so much. Uh, I met you yesterday. So, and yeah. Oh, <laughs> Hare Krishna. I think your, your, this answer that you gave um, partly answered my question already, but I had an additional question saying that if, if, um, if you're hankering for Vapul Seva and you don't get it, as you said, you know, with, which is what happened with Prabhupada's disciples many times. So it is just Vani Seva that we should focus on. And that will get us to becoming a better uh, disciple, right? That is, that yeah, is the so, only so way. What I'm saying is if you're hankering for Vapu Seva, keep hankering. Okay? okay. Virtual life is all about greed. <laughs> it really is all about greed. If we want Krishna, if we want service, if we want Guru, they'll make themselves available. We have to show our greed. Okay, it's not that I'll, I have greed, but I'll give up because it's enough to have Vani Seva. That's, this is a very different attitude. Actually, when we have greed, Vapu and Vani both carry equal weight. That when we have greed to serve the spiritual master, we continue to serve in separation, but we're still greedy for that personal service. It's not that one or the other. Oh, okay, well, if you can't have Vapu, it's all right, just, just, just do Vani. That's a kind of like a, all right, I'll take whatever I can get. Now, greed means I want more. Give me more, you know? I just want to serve. I want to be absorbed in this service. I want my mind, body, heart, soul completely immersed in connecting everything that I do as service, whether it's brushing my teeth, combing my hair, whatever it is, packing my bag, it can all be connected in service. If you think about, for example, motherhood, right? The, the mother's attachment to the child is so strong, the love for the child is so strong that actually everything that she does, even if it's indirectly related to serving the physical aspect of the child, 
is actually a meditation on will this be good for my child? You know, I mean, I remember one time Guru Maharaj, uh, explaining that really with everything we do, and I'm preaching to myself here, um, we should be thinking, if my spiritual master was right here, would I speak like this? If my guru was here, would I think like this? Would I will this? Would I behave like this? Would I make this choice? And in this way, actually, we can keep the connection very, very strong. But yeah, please don't give up any hankering thinking one is okay instead of the other. That's not quite the mood that I was trying to, to express. If you want uh, Babu Seva, hanker, go for it. There's nothing Thank like you. it. It's blissful. Even when the pain, it's even with the pain, it's blissful. There is nothing else like it because you see the transformation that Krishna consciousness and the blessings of devotees, pure devotees, who want nothing more for us other than that we are happy in our loving relationship with Krishna. The transform, the powerful transformation effect of their good wishes, is is really as as something to experience in person. It's very special. Thank you so much. If if I if I may ask a follow up question, um, so this is yeah. a very good perspective that you gave. You know, so even if we don't have Vapu, we pretend or we we ask ourselves that if my spiritual master was here, would I behave a certain way? That's a very good way of very good way of approaching. And and this is a mood of giving, right? You you are doing something to please, but sometimes if you want something from your spiritual master. Um, we should curb that, right? I want him to, as as uh, Satya Bhama Mataji said, I, she desired, uh, it's not explicit, implicitly desired the spiritual master to like the food she cooked, or you would want the spiritual master to um, to approve of the choices you make in life. But mm-hmm. of course, he's not around to give a nod, ya or na, because sometimes the distance is a lot. How do we manage that? Please. So, you know, we're not going to get rid of desires. Desires are always going to be there. This is part of the purification is that first Krishna and Guru start to show us what our desires are. We don't like seeing that we have desires related to the mind and the ego when we're around the spiritual master. We like to think I'm a pure servant, right? I, 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 you know, I remember doing personal service. I love the idea of thinking, yes, I'm fully surrendered and, you know, I'd do anything for spiritual master and, and I, for Guru Dev. And I did not like seeing when I saw, oh my God, I have an ulterior motive. What? I didn't like seeing it. But in order to let go of the ulterior motive, I had to be shown it. Right? You've got to see the dirt in the room to clean it. Don't flake out when the dirt's shown. This is one of the discomforts we have to tolerate in serving the spiritual master is saying, okay, I'm going to hold up a mirror and show you what you need to work on. It's painful, it's uncomfortable, because we'd much rather pr- accept that I'm already there. But if we were already there, would we be here? <laughs> so, so, it's, um, so yeah, so first of all, um, allow your unhealthy desires to be shown, to be willing to see the unhealthy desires, and then set about recognizing them, letting them go, and replacing them with healthy desires. There's got to be um, a sequential transformation. And the more consciously we engage with the sequential uh, transformation, the more we're empowered and the more mercy we attract. Because then we're not passive. We're not just saying, here, Guru Dev, just do your thing. I'm here to waiting to be purified. You know? Actually, no, you're saying, I'm going to engage with the purification process. I will ask you questions. I will get clarification. I will tolerate the pain. And when I find it difficult, I will try and understand where the pain is coming from. And if I can't hear from you directly, I will take shelter of God family. If I can't speak to them, I'll sp- speak to senior devotees. But whatever pain I'm feeling, I want to try and understand what is the healthy side of this pain. And what is a healthy way that I can process this pain? Because I know this pain is there for my betterment. We've all been through pain. We've forgotten. All of us went from childhood to teenage to adult. We went through growing pains. Some of you might remember them, leg aches in the middle of the night, arm aches in the middle of the night, as your joints and your bones are all changing. You know, the psychological pain of growing up from living in a world of everything's just happiness and joy and 
you can even play with a cardboard box to suddenly you're a teenager and you see that, ah, the world's not quite what I thought it was. You know, so we've all been through pain. But when you engage with that pain in the service of the spiritual master consciously, the empowerment and the transformation is quicker. Because we're showing the spiritual master, I want to engage with the transformation process. I'm not just leaving it all up to you to just wave a magic wand. Does that make sense? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Do any of you have services that you feel like you've been asked to do and it's still outstanding? We will. Yeah. So, um, yes, Guru Maharaj, when, we came, when he came to home, he told me that, you know, how should I serve my deities? And uh, he gave me specific instructions that, you know, deities should have uh, only white and soft stuff in the morning for Mangala Arati sweets. And uh, it doesn't always happen because many a times I'm busy. And uh, so Krishna doesn't get um, uh, always white stuff and soft stuff. So sometimes you're making brown thing. <laughs> sometimes you just, you know. So yeah, so things happen. So the time uh, he, he has given me specific time that this is time Krishna should wake up in the morning and sometime like mainly in the weekend because I work full time. And if temple services are there, I'm tired. And uh, so once a week, uh, Krishna doesn't wake up on time. So yes, and I feel really sad. And the time I wake up, basically, if I'm tired and I wake up, so I don't wake up to wake up Krishna. I wake up because I remember that Guru Maharaj has given me this specific instruction that, you know, Krishna should be up by this time. So just his instructions wakes me up, not as in I really want, you know, Krishna to be up in the morning. <laughs> yeah, so... Yeah, and it, it hurts. It basically hurts that, you know, you're not able to follow uh, what he is, does, you know. Does, okay, does your pain of not being able to follow empower you to do better or does it hold you back? It does empower me, but it, I, it, uh, it's very painful. It, I, it's really bad because I did not get many instructions. This was something he didn't even give it as an instruction. He suggested that this is how you should do it. And I felt it, it was given to me as instruction, basically, yeah. So I'm going to ask you again, that pain, does it make it easier for you to execute that service or does it make it harder? So when don't you know. don't, okay, maybe you <laughs> can think about that because yeah, the thing yeah. who gives instruction <clears throat> to the degree to which we surrender to it, we're empowered. But that doesn't necessarily mean we get there instantaneously. Srila Prabhupada surrendered to Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur's instruction to write books and take this message to the West the moment that Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur gave it to him. And then we know this because he spent the next 40 years preparing. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Preparing to execute it. And then he executed it. But actually... He was fulfilling his spiritual master's instruction from the moment he started preparing. Mm. So even with a simple instruction like this, which sounds simple on the surface, but your spiritual master somewhere uh, sees that for you, this is going to have a transformational effect. Just preparing everything you prepare during the week and subsequently, whether it's in your mind, whether it's your attitude, whether it's your timing, whether it's getting the ingredients, whether it's whatever planning you have to do, all of that is in the pursuit of fulfilling his instruction and it is fulfilling his instruction. So that's not to get big headed, but that is there to encourage you and empower you that you've already surrendered to his instruction and the result will manifest. Just don't let the guilt become toxic and hold you back from fulfilling it because that's one of Maya's biggest tricks is making us feel hopeless. Oh, uh, thank you. The answer was really helpful. <laughs> I was, I've been thinking about it from last six, seven months, actually, more than that since last time he told me this and your answer was really, and this time when he came, I really wanted to ask him and tell him that Guru Maharaj, I'm not able to follow what you know. I'm doing it at least at some time, like not sometime, most of the time, but it just sometime, it just doesn't happen. And your answer was very, very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Krishna. Yeah. Uh, Niti Lakshana, Mataji. Hare Krishna Chitti Mataji, thank you. Um, it was just, uh, Mataji was talking about the instructions from Guru Maharaj. 
and every week we have a, a meeting with our Guru Maharaj on Fridays. Can you mm -hmm. hear me properly? Yeah? Yes, I can. I can hear you. Yeah. So the, about the instructions, uh, obviously I just got initiated last year. I've never had a chance to spend some time with my Guru Maharaj. And he, he has given us an open door how to keep in touch with him every month. But I'm finding it very difficult because obviously I just um, met my Guru Maharaj last February and he accepted me as his disciples. And then he initiated me in August. And to keep in a, a, a contact with him, I don't know why I'm finding it difficult, even though on WhatsApp, to get instructions from him. You know, like having a, a, a close relationship because we've not had a close relationship at all. Because he just expected, he just um, accepted me as his disciple in February last year. And then same time as in six months time, he gave me his initiation. So because of this COVID, we never had the opportunity to have that. Uh, I didn't have the opportunity to know my Guru Maharaj well. Although I knew him uh, because he's always traveling. My Kara Guru Maharaj is Kadama Kanana. So he's always traveling. So there's no possibility. There were times when he used to come to Britain. But at the time, I was just confused who to choose my Guru Maharaj. So I was still searching. And obviously, last year was the one that I chose. But saying that and about the instruction, like every week when he uh, he has a meeting with, with us, and I felt that he's giving all of us, the disciples, the instructions, like, you know, if you wake up early, do your chants, chants uh, all at one time, that will, before 10 o'clock, would be, uh, you know, it'll, it'll empower you more to do it every day. And I, mm -hmm. since I have noticed, since I started doing what my Guru Maharaj instructed me, I felt more and more that I can, feel the whole day goes really nicely. And on top of it, I can do Nashinga Dev's uh, chanting. I do my Nashinga Dev's two, three rounds, two rounds. Uh, and plus I do my Guru Maharaj's five rounds. So by Guru Maharaj's instructions, this has helped me a lot. Even though I don't have close relationship with him, in our know, close uh, uh, contact with him, one thing I'm finding difficult is how do I um, approach him? Because with me, I'm a person who likes to have a close contact with a person to person. And because obviously that's impossible at this moment, how do I go about it? If you can advise me, because I'm finding it very difficult. Sure. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. I, th I think the last 18 months, because of also travel limitations, devotees haven't got to spend as much time hearing, even if you don't get to do personal service, but actually personally hearing a class. Uh, and especially if you're early on in your relationship as well in this lifetime with your spiritual master, then uh, maybe it feels like you've missed that early nurturing. So I think, how do you approach it? Um, just a couple, of, a couple of things come come to mind. Things are opening up now. So if you are able to travel, to meet in person, to have some personal association, I think that would be good. The second thing is, try talking to your spiritual master. They're, they're, they're people, they're, they're humans, they're transcendental humans, but they are also people. They have feelings, they have thoughts, they have ways they communicate. And yes, there's a general instruction, you will come on on Friday and you will speak together, etc. But there is, you know, there's a reason you chose him. Yeah, uh, that then you felt compelled to follow his instructions. So actually reveal your mind in confidence to your spiritual master, express him, send him an email, tell him how you're feeling, say, you know, share with him some of the things you've shared here and uh, ask him what, what does he suggest is a good way for you to connect. Okay, thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Namrata Mataji, you want to ask? Hare Krishna Mataji. Please accept my humble obeisance. Uh, so uh, I wanted to ask um, what if, uh, due to maybe our introvert nature or something, something like that, uh, what if we are not able to uh, convey ourselves properly to Guru Maharaj? Uh, Maybe, you know, uh, if I talk about myself, sometimes I really think whatever I wanted to ask, uh, he is giving a generalized instructions over the classes and all. But then, uh, you know, there are certain specifications you want to talk that um, 
you want to relate it to yourself and ask to Guru Maharaj. Mm -hmm. So uh, very firstly, uh, I completely understand he had his time is really precious, and uh, and then I think that uh, uh, I'll try to approach some senior devotee or try to get answer from that, and uh, then I always uh, try to uh, get answer, but then uh, my communication with Guru Maharaj is, you know, left out. So I, I always think that, uh, I, I always think that, uh, oh, this is something material I should not ask uh, Guru Maharaj. This is uh, something, uh, you know, uh, not worth his time or something like that. So I always keep thinking like that and avoid, uh, talking to Maharaj. So um, how can I open up? I really feel like... It, are, are your questions material though? Are they... I mean, genuinely, if you ask yourself the questions, are they actually not really for your spiritual master? Um, actually, senior devotees can answer that, but sometimes you know you want a confirmation from your spiritual um i mean from your master or from your guru maharaj that am Why? i working on a because they, of course i'm a new fight <laughs> uh, hey, that's I, like a answer. why do you want confirmation from your spiritual master because uh, somewhere i feel that you know that that's the final word what i have to follow and there is nothing beyond that i mean there's no doubts beyond that left okay so it, right now it's important for you to hear the instruction directly from his mouth for you to believe that the instruction is coming directly from the spiritual master uh, <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. This, this, we will only, uh, I'll only be able to really serve if we're really honest. And you'll grow just by talking about this. You're dropping blocks already just by talking about this. And you're helping many people as well because you're not the only one who's felt this. Okay. Uh, so, so right now, does it feel like that? That there's some things that if he says it, it must be a fact, but if someone else says it, I'm not sure if Guru Maharaj would say the same thing. Um, kind of. Yeah? Okay. And you also asked another aspect is that you want to be able to open up more to your spiritual master. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is one very strong aspect that I'm thinking. I really want to have a communication or at least to an extent, even if I'm far away from Guru Maharaj, uh, I should at least be able to understand what his instructions are. I mean, it's about the communication. Okay, so this That's is an important I'm serving in a Vapu mode, or I mean, it can be a Vani, but, <laughs> but you I should clarity. be able to, yes, clarity. That, that's absolutely fine, because actually, the Guru-Disciple relationship is dynamic. It's not just that, okay, instructions given, that's it, bus finished. Our understanding of what the instruction is very important because it's important that the student understands what the lesson is in uh, before they can execute it, right? If we pretend we understand or ask someone else who maybe hasn't heard it, then yes, it, it may lead to some confusion. So actually the disciple, it's healthy for the guru-disciple relationship that if we're not clear, that we're able to go back to the spiritual master and say, you know, Guru Dev in class, you said this. I'm in this situation. Can you please give me some guidance on how this might apply in my situation? And what you'll find is you're scared that if you keep doing that, then what if you start becoming a nuisance? What if, you know, you, you start asking him for too many questions and he doesn't have time for you, etc. cetera? Guru's a grown-up. You're a grown-up. Guru knows what they're getting into when they take a disciple you should know what you're getting into when you take on a guru, right? And there is always going to be some learning period, some communication period where you're going to need clarification on instruction 
You're going to need contextualization on instructions. And Guru is aware that they're going to get questions. So take advantage of the time that they are present on the planet, that you do have access. And if you can't do it verbally, we're not all good at verbal communication. Do it on email. Do it on email. And if you start, you'll notice actually very quickly, you'll start to understand what he means just by his explanation on just a few start writing to him a few times you'll start understanding but you don't have to necessarily write expecting an answer you know but still tomorrow would always tell us write to me at least once a month so i know what's going on for you and <clears throat> actually he knew what was going on for us anyway i had many examples we would ask me oh so give me feedback on what's happening with the disciples in the uk and i wasn't always au fait with you know knew exactly what was happening with every single person so i'd share what i could and then there'd be a couple of people where i'd be like okay you know i haven't seen this person so much and i don't know so he's like oh yes this person is at this place and this is going on in their life and you know but i could see he was that was some uh understanding he had of that person from a deeper place not necessarily because of communication so guru actually in one sense already knows what's going on for us when we connect when we make an endeavor to connect verbally through writing etc time to pause get our thoughts and heart onto paper be transparent with the spiritual master even if we don't get an external response we get an internal response and we can recognize that internal response even around us through even if it comes through another person so get into that practice of regularly writing to him because okay. even when he does respond, he may respond to every single one for the first six months and then the responses might be less frequent, but you will always get a response. Sometimes the response will be in writing, sometimes the response will be internal, sometimes the response will be through another person, but first start communicating. Open yourself to receive. Okay. So for, I think I should um, maybe once in a month or maybe once in 15, Not 20 days, I should write a yeah, at least once a month, send it. But in between, if you want to just write a letter, you don't even have to send it. It's very powerful. I was, um, when I was serving Gurudev again, you know, being around him all the time, practically 24 7, the mind, body, everything becomes over familiar because you get caught up in the activities. I really didn't want to lose the guru disciple aspect. I didn't want to lose my receptivity to learning. I really, really didn't. And so I often found myself, what I would do is in the evening when I take rest or if there was a quiet moment, I would sit and I'd write to him and I'd tell him all the things that I wanted to tell him or get clarification on. And throughout the day, I would get clarification either from him directly or through another God sibling or so, sometimes even from someone random. You know, because even in Vapu Seva, you can see the Vani Seva and Vani relationship come alive. So keep, keep writing. But Tirta Maharaj's practice during Prabhupada's time on the planet and after his departure was to write to him very regularly. And he explicitly says that he feels that his relationship with Srila Prabhupada just kept getting stronger and stronger each year, even after Prabhupada left, because he never let go of this practice of writing to the master. It's not just that we take initiation, the bond is made and that's it, everything you know, it just floats. No, we're on a ship. Okay, ships need direction. Uh, they, they need a goal. Uh, they need regular input. You know, you need to put effort into it. They need fuel. Uh, it needs all of those things. It's not just that, okay, I'm on the boat now. Let's just float and just wait for the tide to carry me. Guru disciple relationship doesn't work like that. It's not passive, it's active. Okay, so engage with it actively. Your spiritual master loves you. Your spiritual master has voluntarily Nobody's forced them, has voluntarily chosen to uh, accept you as a disciple and direct Krishna's lotus feet. So engage with them. Okay. Uh, so just a little follow. So um, being an aspiring devotee, even still, uh, I should do that? Yes, even more so, because when we're aspiring, it's an opportunity for Guru to test us and for us to test Guru. But am I really sure that I want to make this commitment? Can I surrender every aspect of myself to this person? Yes, exactly. <laughs> all, all this is coming to my mind before I get initiated. So um, 
I, I really want to connect to my spiritual master before I get initiated. Absolutely. Maybe this, maybe this is a process. Uh, it it will get uh, you know uh, ahead, but yes. up to a basic level, you see, uh, I should be sure enough. Not that I I um, I want uh, Guru Maharaj also that you know to know me that. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, you are not aware of cert certain subtle things uh, inside you. Yeah, but you, the thing is, this is the power of writing to them, is that often we think, okay, they need to know everything about my material situation to guide me. We're not here to become materially perfect. Mm -hmm. If you've taken initiation or aspiring, if any of us are taking, uh, aspiring to take initiation to become materially perfect, you're in the wrong thing. <laughs> You know, we're, we're taking initiation, we join that, that disciplic succession to become spiritually perfect. And so uh, in seeking spiritual perfection, the guru doesn't have to know every nitty gritty detail of my, our material life. I mean, we've had so many different lifetimes under the guidance of spiritual masters. Sometimes you've been a man, sometimes a woman, sometimes, you know, a demigod. That this, these personalities, Guru Tattva has been giving us shelter for a long time. Uh, but the guidance comes from, it transcends what our material situation is. There needs to be some understanding, yes, okay, because we're in a human experience, they're in a human experience, but it's not necessary. But this is what I'm saying, active engagement in the relationship. Don't just expect it to magically happen, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Mataji. Yeah, one more hand raised by Itumile. Okay, uh, Srimati, I'm just thinking, shall we make this the last one? Because I'm conscious your meeting is only supposed to be an hour. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay, Mataji. Uh, as long as you, you have time and I'm okay with that. Yeah. Um, so, and we'll take next question. Please go ahead, um, Itumele. Okay. Hi, Krishna. Um, I wanted to ask about the relationship between the Diksha Guru and um sadhus or i don't mm -hmm. know if we should call them shiksha or i'll just refer to them as sadhus and if there is an a, a seeming misalignment in the instructions how do you deal with that and and is the principle that the instruction of the spiritual master is absolutely paramount or comes first so, so your question about if sadhus instructions are contradictory to the diksha gurus Seemingly contradictory. Seemingly contradictory. Okay. Yeah. I'll give... Sometimes, um, go, sometimes okay. it comes across like that, you know, because actually if you look at Srila Prabhupada's Acharya and his disciples, they've all been trained by Srila Prabhupada to follow certain things exactly the same. Okay? But in serving his... In fulfilling uh, his service to his spiritual master to have, you know, the holy names in every town and every village by making Krishna consciousness available to everybody, there's got to be more diversity in terms of accessibility because we are all diverse and variegated. So different spiritual masters, Shiksha and Diksha, have been given uh, the empowerment and instruction to take care of different aspects and em emphasis on different aspects of Krishna consciousness. So. One of the reasons we sometimes, you know, pick particular gurus is we resonate with the mood they have, the emphasis on a particular aspect of devotional service they have. Because if you look at it, 16 rounds, four regs, cooperate with devotees, read Srimad Bhagavatam, read Srila Prabhupada's books, those things, they're universal, okay? The gurus don't, and sadhus don't contradict on, on that side. I mean, anybody who contradicts that, then you just don't really listen. But the, the seeming contradictions might be just an emphasis on the moods might be slightly different. You know, so some gurus, uh, their mood is to emphasize, for example, being able to uh, make Krishna consciousness accessible. Other gurus may uh, have more of an emphasis on staying chaste to the more orthodox principles in terms of the way we present Krishna consciousness. Others focus on relationships, others on community, others on yagyas and training etc so different gurus have different moods and we're attracted to these different gurus because of their different moods uh, and we're attracted to our god family for that reason so it is important 
that we also have shiksha gurus who can nurture that mood. Because if we, there's a difference between being with sadhus. We can appreciate every sadhu, the diversity, uh, the inspiration that they have to serve Krishna in so many different ways. But if we're trying to follow a particular path and direction and mood, we need like-minded individuals who are also of that mood. So our shiksha should resonate with that. So when we take shiksha from devotees who uh, we feel are going to support our service to our spiritual master, it's more helpful if it resonates with the mood of the spiritual master. You know? Um, so, and that's not necessarily because we don't, that's not about not appreciating the other mood. We can appreciate the other mood. But if Guru is saying, go in this direction to stay on that path, if you keep looking in another person's direction who's, who's on a different path, it's going to become very confusing. Does that make sense? It's one of the reasons why, um, you know, Srila Prabhupada would say, just read my books. There's no need to read any other books. Not because he didn't value or f think that there was anything of value in other people's books. Of course there are. In fact, many of his books reference many of our other charyas, sometimes even references his god brothers. But he knew his disciples were young and raw in their Krishna consciousness, and it would become confusing. Uh, and they wouldn't be able to distinguish between the different subtleties, although the fundamental principles were the same. But as we mature in our Krishna consciousness, we can hear other subtleties, other perspectives without becoming disturbed by it uh, and at the same time appreciating it. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay, Srimati, you're the boss. Thank you so much, uh, Mataji, for this, such a wonderful class and nice question answer session. Um, you enlightened um, on this topic very well. Thank you so much. Um, devotees, any more questions or comments? Okay, I think I we've come to a natural close. Yeah. We've gone yeah. half an hour over <laughs> as well. So I yeah. know devotees have things to do It's uh, in the evening. So um, we'll be back next Monday and we'll yeah. focus on Rani Seva then, yes? Yes, thank you so much once again. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Vancha Kalpata Rupyascha, Kripa Sindhu Pevacha, Patitanam Pavane Bhyo, Vaishnavi Bhyo, Namunamaha. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Guru Maharaj Ki Jai, His Holiness Bhakti Pida Swami Maharaj Ki Jai. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Mataji. Thank you.